I'd had pr two previous sermons on the subject of prayer. In uh, December the 2nd and also on the 16th, I had the first and the second of that particular series. And since I had not completed the series, I wanted to complete it and uh, talk to Mr. Baird to see if I could have this opportunity today to uh, complete the series. And uh, then I'll stay out of his hair and, and let him preach to you here for a while. I'm not going to review the uh, things that I have previously said, but I would presume that uh, there are tapes available of uh, both of those particular series if you missed either or both of them. And rather than reviewing, uh, I would like then just to, to refer you to possibly getting a tape of it. I presume you have a tape library here that would have those available. If not, maybe you can talk to someone else who has notes of uh, those particular sermons. So I would like to continue where I left off last time and uh, hope and expect then that I will finish this particular series. By the way, I might say that I have also written this up as an article and submitted it to the uh, new Good News magazine. Whether or not it will be accepted and printed or not, I don't know, but you might see uh, some of these things in print. If you do, uh, it'll be a little different from the sermon. It seems like every sermon uh, uh, from the same notes comes out a little differently, and also if you put it in article form, it comes out a little differently, and maybe you have uh, additional points or leave out some points that might be otherwise included. Well, the last uh, time I had concluded by covering the, the question about the various things that we can pray for and that we can ask God for, and I gave you quite a list quite a, in quite detail about those things that we can go to God in prayer about, not only what we can ask for, but what we can pray about. Next, I would like to ask, where should we pray? Now, some of these things uh, should be very obvious as far as that's concerned, but I think it is good that we at least review them briefly to uh, uh, cover the subject as comprehensively as possible. Now, you all know the scripture in Matthew 6, 6 that says that we are to go into our closet. <clears throat> I would like to turn to this in Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 6. And, of course, uh, we've already seen quite a bit in, the, in this particular chapter uh, concerning the uh, so-called Lord's Prayer. And I think we may have also read very briefly verse 6. But you, when you pray, enter into your closet. Now, the word closet here is not uh, an accurate meaning in today's language of uh, what was meant by Jesus when he spoke these words. It is translated in some of the more modern translations, like the Revised Standard Version, uh, room. It's not talking, you know, about your clothes co closet, where you put clothes, uh, or whatever other kind of closet you have. Uh, uh, I'm not saying that it would uh, exclude that, but it's not specifically talking about that kind of a room. So it's just when you pray, enter into your room, we might say into a private place, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which sees in secret shall reward you. And the word openly is uh, possibly an added word and, and uh, does not appear in most of the modern translations. Of course, if God does reward you, I suppose that would be open, but uh, that's not in the uh, Greek or not implied in the Greek. So we are to pray, at least talking now about our, the principal part of prayer, that that is to be done in a private place, in a room, by ourselves. Now, I realize that there may be some uh, rare occasions when a person does not have such facilities available, and you have to improvise, and you have to sometimes uh, uh, do a little differently than you would in the normal routine of things. But I think particularly if uh, you're traveling, and uh, you have a motel room, and you have only one room, or maybe you have one room and a bathroom, if you would call those two rooms, and maybe you have uh, several children and uh, a spouse with you, uh, then obviously you're not going to have the same opportunity to go to a private room privately that you would have if you were at home in the normal routine of things. And all we can do in those circumstances is to do the best uh, as we can. Sometimes that requires a little bit of uh, improvising. A man called me about this uh, the other night on the phone. He had uh, heard the other, uh, well, he would heard the whole series, actually. He's in the North Church. And he had a problem, he said, because he lives with his mother, who is unconverted, and they live in about two rooms of the house. They're poor, and uh, only those two rooms are heated. The rest of the house is not heated, and I suppose it was, you know, what, 
17 degrees or whatever it was, 15 degrees, uh, the other night, and uh, he's wondering what he should do, you know. Well, you have to uh, be a little innovative in circumstances like that, and uh, if you think about it a little bit, if you pray about it a little bit, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find solutions to those things that may seem to be problems. Now, in addition to private prayer, of course, we should be in an attitude of prayer, which we'll see uh, more later, at all times, or be, you know, quick to pray, or be ready to pray at any particular season. But there also may be occasions when the family may pray together. You know, there's a, a saying that families that pray together stay together, and uh, I think that might well be so. And uh, I know that many families in the church do pray together, maybe briefly, daily, or weekly, or however often, or maybe at uh, irregular times. And uh, in such occasion, of course, the, the prayer can be led by the father or the head of the house, and also the mother can uh, also pray, and maybe the children can pray, you know, uh, successively or whatever, depending on the desires of the parents. And there, of course, is also public prayer, and the public prayer is primarily limited to uh, the church, where we have uh, an opening prayer and a closing prayer at the time of services, or in a Bible study in the opening prayer. And uh, maybe there might be some other occasions, like spokesman club or whatever, but uh, generally the uh, public prayers are rather limited uh, as far as opportunity is concerned. So when we're talking about praying, we're talking primarily about our personal, private prayer before God in wherever we're able to go for that particular private prayer. As I mentioned earlier, in one of the earlier uh, sermons of this particular series, you can even pray upside down in a well, you know, hanging by your foot. That's not the ideal place to pray, or ideal posture, but uh, we can pray, you know, at many occasions, no matter where we are, what the circumstances are. Now, we might consider for a moment some of the Bible examples of where people in the Bible prayed. We find several examples of Jesus Christ, where he played, uh, prayed rather in solitary places, uh, where uh, he went to the temple to pray, or where others went to the temple to pray. And of course, we can't do that. We don't have any temple. Uh, they prayed in the desert, on a mountain, or on a mountain top. Some of them prayed in prison. I wouldn't recommend you go to prison just to pray, but you know, if you're in prison, that's a good place to pray. Uh, or an upper chamber. You may recall the account of Daniel, how he was in an upper chamber and prayed, and his accusers uh, found him doing this. Or on a housetop. Now, I wouldn't advise that for most of you, unless you have a flat house with maybe a balustrade around it, as uh, was common in the time of Peter and in the place. And also sometimes the housetop would be maybe a little room on the top of a house, a flat-roofed house, and then maybe just a, a single room that's uh, up there for various purposes. Now, the Pharisees, they like to pray at the corner of the streets. I presume most of you, though, do not follow their practice. So, where should we pray? You can find places to pray if you really want to, and if you're really trying to please God, if you're really trying to get close to God. Next, when should we pray? And we might say, how often should we pray, and a little bit later we'll come to how long should you pray. When should we pray? Let's turn to uh, a scripture in the Psalms to see the example of David. Psalm 55. And while we're turning uh, to Psalm 55, I might just recall again something we have already seen in uh, Matthew 6, where in the prayer, which is called... Uh, the Lord's Prayer, a part of the points that we can pray about is, Give us this day our daily bread. I think that this would imply, then, that we have at least a daily prayer. You know, it's not just a monthly prayer or an annual prayer, but a daily prayer. But now in Psalm 55 and in verse 16, we find what David says here. And uh, as for me, he says, I will call upon God, and the Eternal shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray, and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. On this particular case, not only does he say when he is going to pray, but he is going to cry aloud. He prayed aloud. 
And we find many examples, of course, in the Bible of a person uh, praying aloud. We also find some examples of people praying silently in the mind, you might say. And uh, possibly we'll see that a little bit later in the book of Nehemiah in one example. But he says, evening and morning and at noon. You, I suppose we would think, well, if we were doing this, we would pray morning, noon, and night. But uh, in Bible parlance, of course, uh, the sequence is a little differently because the day begins in the uh, uh, a different time than we think of today. Anyway, evening and morning and at noon, when are these particular times? Well, they might be variously interpreted, but uh, there was a temple routine uh, at that time, or a, a tabernacle routine, as it was in the case of David, because it didn't have the temple built yet. But you'll even find some reference to these uh, routines of prayer at the temple. Uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, I won't turn there, but there is one example of this, and there are others. Uh, it talks about the hour of prayer in the afternoon, which was the ninth hour. Now, the ninth hour, of course, in their way of reckoning, was from 6 a.m., or approximately in the morning. <coughs> in other words, this was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I suppose from 3 to 4, approximately. I don't suppose that they had... Uh, uh, quartz uh, crystal watches in those days, so maybe it wasn't quite as prompt or uh, done exactly in the way we do, but maybe just as a general time. But anyway, uh, the practice was that the temple uh, time of prayer was in the evening, quote unquote evening, was what we would call afternoon, around three o'clock, around three to four o'clock. Then in the morning, the time was the third hour, which is 9 a.m., so I suppose we would say about 9 to 12, or excuse me, 9 to 10. And then noon, of course, that uh, we would all understand that, which is also called the sixth hour, so from, say, 12 to 1 o'clock or so. Uh, whether this was exactly what uh, David meant, as far as the exact times, I don't know. But uh, chances are that's what he had reference to, rather than as we might think, you know, early in the morning when we get up and at noon, and then uh, late at night before we go to bed. We might think of it more in those terms, but probably David didn't think of it in that same way. Now, there's another example of this same thing in the example of Daniel. If you would turn over to Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. I don't think I'll turn there. It just mentions that that was his practice of praying uh, three times a day also. Daniel 6, verse 10. So now we have seen the example of uh, two of the very worthy men of ancient time that uh, have given us a part of, of God's word of what they did. The practice of praying three times a day. Now, this may not be possible or practical for some in the church because of circumstances. You know, some are not able to uh, get away from their normal routine of work at these particular specific times. But I give this to you to show you the example of certain men in the Bible. And what you do, you know, is between you and God. I'm just showing you now what uh, examples we find in the Bible. Now, there's an old saying, and this isn't in the Bible, of course, but it was... Uh, apparently originated in the 17th century, around 1620, that goes as follows. Prayer should be the key of the morning and the lock of the night. I think uh, sort of implying, you know, that the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night was an appropriate time to pray. But aside from that, as I had refer referred to earlier, we should be in an attitude of prayer or to be quick to be in an attitude of prayer at all times. Let's notice a few scriptures in connection with this. First in Romans, the 12th chapter. Romans 12 and verse 12. Romans 12, 12. Uh, just notice the last part of the sentence. Continuing instant in prayer. Uh, he's now mentioning some things here that we should be doing. And among those, continuing instant in prayer. Now the Living Bible uh, renders this prayerful always. Prayerful always. And in the book of Ephesians, we have a similar statement. Ephesians 6, verse 18, if you'll turn there. Ephesians 6, 18. Now, of course, we're talking now not about being on your knees continually, but being in an attitude of prayer or being quickly able to pray to God. Ephesians 6, 18, and just uh, the first part of the verse, praying always. And he mentions, of course, some other things relating to prayer, but uh, uh, obviously you can't pray always, 24 hours a day, literally, but rather to be in an attitude of prayer, to be quick to uh, 
think in your mind, you might say, to cry out in your mind to God whenever there are problems, difficulties, or maybe thoughts uh, that come to your mind. And when you see things uh, happening in the world today, things that are sad and so forth, maybe you can, in your mind, you know, pray out to God, you know, thy kingdom come, and you really want God's kingdom to come, and for this present evil world and all that's attendant with that to end. It's put in different words in Thessalonians. Let's notice that. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Praying without ceasing. Or I think some say without intermission. In other words, as a part of your activities, a part of your, your uh, very life, that you are praying, you know, without ceasing. In other words, you never stop praying. Now, obviously, we have to carry on our business, we have to carry on our work, and we can't be praying 24 hours a day and sleep and eat and do our job and so forth, and that's not what it's talking about. But not interrupting our regular routine of prayer, praying without ceasing or without intermission. Now, I'd like to turn back to the book of Nehemiah to uh, just one example of a, of a silent, uh, you might say, instant prayer, the kind of prayer that I think that is implied by these last three scriptures that we've gone over. Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah 2. On this particular occasion, Nehemiah had uh, heard sad things about what was going on in Jerusalem, and uh, he was uh, the king's cupbearer, which means uh, apparently that he was the wine steward, we might say, for the king the custodian of the wine, and also the wine taster. And so that before the king would drink of a a particular bottle of wine, that uh, this uh, wine taster, this wine steward, this cupbearer, would first drink of this wine to, of course, make sure that it was not poisoned. And then if he didn't die, of course, well, then the king would go ahead and drink wine, because I guess it was rather the practice in those times to try to kill kings uh, by giving them wine that was poisoned in some way or the other. Now, this was a rather trusted position because I suppose conceivably uh, a person in that situation could uh, deceive the monarch and uh, uh, could uh, maybe by substitution or who knows what uh, drink something that would cause uh, death to the king. And so apparently it was a quite a trusted position even though you might think that, of that as being a very high position in the government. But he had come before the king and uh, he was very sad because of the circumstances that were going on in Jerusalem, and the king asked him about this, and what was the matter with him. And uh, let's see, uh, verse 2, this is Nehemiah 2, verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is your countenance sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. So he realized that he was just sad, that he was upset about something. Then I was very sore afraid. Now, I don't know exactly why, uh, but maybe we could uh, surmise that he realized that uh, he was in a very delicate situation here. Maybe there were racial uh, feelings in the, the kingdom, and if he stated exactly what was wrong uh, with him and what he felt bad about, maybe the king would uh, not like it. And uh, maybe you say, you know, well, people around me are supposed to be jolly and friendly, otherwise, you know, I get rid of them and uh, they lose their heads. Uh, you know, such uh, did happen on some occasions. Anyway, he was sore afraid for whatever reason, and and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what do you make request? I guess he expected there would be a request, because that's usually what people would do, you know, they would come to the king to ask this, that, or the other thing. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, what do you suppose that uh, Nehemiah did here? And Nehemiah said, well, now, uh, uh, King uh, Artaxerxes, would you please excuse me? I've got to go away now for an hour to my private place and pray. No, obviously he didn't do that. He prayed in his mind, in his thoughts, and you can be sure that it wasn't a very long prayer, but it was probably a very impassioned prayer. You know, God, please help me and to say just the right thing to this man who has great power and authority. And then I said to the king, such and such and such, which I won't go ahead and read. So this is, to me, one of those examples of being instant in prayer. 
Now, continuing about when should we pray and how often should we pray, I'd like to bring out a couple of problems that we do have in the church in regard to this, of when we pray, how often we pray, and uh, the next point that will come a little bit later is how long we should pray. And these problems, of course, are the extremes. Usually those who are the center of the road do not have the problem, and I guess maybe all of us think, you know, I'm the center of the road and everybody else is either the right or the left, when that may not be the case. People are often extremists, and certainly we in the church are good examples of that. We're not temperate and not balanced as we often should be. Now, on the one hand, some neglect to pray at all or pray very little, and I wonder how such people ever get, expect to get into God's kingdom. They, uh, if they feel that they can under such circumstances, I think they are deceiving themselves. But now let's consider the other extreme. And the other extreme is what I call sometimes the, a prayer hermit. Do you know a prayer hermit or maybe a Bible study hermit? Some people have the idea, you know, I'd like to go off in a cave somewhere and spend the rest of my life praying and studying the Bible and uh, maybe fasting, but that's not quite so pleasant, maybe. Uh, and anyway, just to disregard the rest of the world and all I have to do is pray and study the Bible. Well, some of us on occasion, and there aren't very many, but there are some of us, who are like that in the church, especially when we come into the church, some uh, filled with zeal fall into this particular trap. Let me con consider this now from two points of view. First, with those who have unconverted spouses. And there have been numerous problems down to the years that have come to my attention with this very problem. One person comes into the church, the spouse does not. And the spouse who is converted with great enthusiasm and so on uh, continues, or, or rather starts, to devote just as much time as possible to Bible study and prayer and so on. All of a sudden, they really become the saint, where before they had been the sinner, now they go to the other extreme. They closet themselves for hours, neglecting their spouse, and you know, it might be the husband or wife, it happens both ways, and they neglect the family. And I suppose they are in their closet praying, asking God that your will might be done in my life, praying, God help my light to shine, but they don't realize that their light will not shine out of that closet. Now, have you ever thought of that? You know, we're supposed to let our light shine, but he says, don't put it under a bushel basket. And when you are in your closet, you're under the bushel basket, you might say. Your light doesn't shine from there. If you're spending all of your time in your prayer closet, your light isn't shining. Now remember, I'm talking about an extreme. I'm not talking about a frequent problem, but an occasional problem. So such a person has their light under a bushel basket. They don't have time for good works, or the time they ought to have for good works. They don't have the time to take care of their family as they ought to, or their personal responsibilities. And here's where you have to have wisdom and balance to have the right perspective and to do things in the right amount. Now, in such cases, if there is anyone in this auditorium today, any of you who might have a similar situation, in such cases you need to try to arrange prayer and study time. You all need to do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't do those things, but you need to do it when the unconverted spouse is away. And, uh, you know, they, they surely are not going to be with you 24 hours a day. Uh, they're going to be working, or they're going to be going on errands, or they're going to be busy with their other activities, or they're going to be sleeping, and uh, so on. There are times, you see, when you can arrange to get away privately when you're not going to upset your unconverted spouse. And try not to call attention to your private, what they might say, devotions. In other words, be unobtrusive. Try to do this privately and uh, secretly as much as that is possible. It may not be possible totally, but at least, uh, you know, don't uh, try to make a big deal of it. Some of them, you know, people try to make a big deal of it, and all of a sudden, you know, here now, well, I've got to spend my time in prayer, and you can go jump in the lake while I do that. And uh, then they just disregard all of the other Christian responsibilities, and they devote all of their time, or at least too much of their time, to prayer and Bible study. Now, if you're not careful about this, you may antagonize your mate, your spouse, 
and cause much family problems. You may find your children are off doing things they shouldn't do when you're in there in your prayer closet. And uh, you may find you'll have great marital problems. And this, as I said, has caused much trouble in some families. In some cases, it has caused divorces. And uh, some people, you know, have uh, lost their husband or their wife just because of this, not having balance. Now, if there, we have these two extremes, maybe this is the better of the two extremes, if I can evaluate it properly, and maybe I can. So I don't want to make it all negative, and I don't want to overemphasize it, because I realize that, that this is not a big problem for a lot of people, but it is a big problem for a few people. <clears throat> so be balanced. Be temperate. And don't shirk or neglect your family responsibilities. Otherwise, what good is all your prayer if you don't live the life that God expects you to live? The life of love, which is outgoing concern, and you might say, first of all, for your family, for your spouse, and then for others. Now, family responsibilities, if you will read the scriptures, is of major concern to God. And I'm sure that you'll find more commands relating to the family responsibilities of husbands and wives and parents than you'll find commands on how much and how often and where you ought to pray. Now, another problem is where both husband and wife are members. It seems like that in this situation, the extreme is that the, the one spouse seems to forget about the other, or forget about the children. And it seems like about all they have time for is their prayer and Bible study, which you know could, I'm not saying it is, but it could be a selfish thing. They leave the care of the children or the household, the family responsibilities up to the spouse while they, quote, get their prayer time, end quote. Now, I want to emphasize the word get. Now, what is the word get? That's the exact opposite, of course, of outgoing concern or love for others. Now, if we are doing this, we are not showing love to our spouse and to our children as we ought. And in such circumstances, we may need to take turns looking after the children or taking care of family or household responsibilities so that the spouse has equal opportunity to, quote, get their prayer time in. I realize that each situation is different, and sometimes maybe the wife can stay home and have time at home to do this uh, while the husband is away, and uh, maybe it's more difficult for the husband to find time, and or vice versa. You know, in some cases the wife works. Uh, each family situation is different. But anyway, you need to give consideration and love, show love to your spouse so that you're sure that your spouse has equal opportunity to have time in prayer and Bible study as well, and so that one is not saddled with all the responsibility while the other is off getting their prayer time in. Now, if you are spending a lot of time, and I'm saying now a lot of time, in prayer and Bible study, you may be, as I say, neglecting your family and other responsibilities and not showing the love that, of course, all of this is about. Because the Christian life, you know, is one of love, showing love. Outgoing concern for the one loved, and certainly we should love our spouse and our children, at least in a different way, than we do other people. And of course, if we don't do this, we're not properly practicing real Christianity and not letting our light shine. And again, you may have your light under a bushel. You know, your light should shine first to those nearest around you, your, your spouse, your children, and then secondly to the rest of the world. We need balance in all of this. We should not be extremists in either way. We should not neglect prayer and Bible study, but on the other hand, we should not overdo it. We have to have balance. We have to ask God for balance. We should pray daily, we should pray regularly, and we should pray long, but not too long. Now, thankfully, this is not a major problem, and it only affects maybe a few people. Next, how long should we pray? How long should we pray each day? You can't turn anywhere in the Bible and it says, Now thou shalt pray X number of minutes or hours or whatever uh, each day. The Bible doesn't say anything like that any more than it says how often you must fast, except, of course, there we're commanded to fast one day a year. But, uh, you know, that's just what's required of us and commanded, and we should obviously do it a lot more than that. 
But how long should we pray each day? Uh, I want to go through some examples in the Bible. And uh, since the Bible does not specify exact times, I'm not going to lay down any rules or laws, nor have there been as far as that's concerned in the church that I know of. There have been some suggestions, and uh, it seems like some have disregarded them, others have uh, uh, latched onto them and been very religious about it, uh, maybe to uh, the detriment of their family, as we have just been mentioning. So this is up to the individual, of course, what the individual is going to do. It's like the offerings that we give God. I'm not speaking of the tithe, but I'm speaking about the offering, which ex ex expresses to God, you know, our possibly our degree of conversion or our attitude. Matthew 26. Let's turn there first. Matthew 26. And look at uh, one of Christ's examples. Matthew 26. Now, here was Jesus Christ, and we'll see at least on one occasion what his example was to the apostles, who were the leaders of the church at that time. Or they were going to be leaders very shortly. <clears throat> they were being prepared to be leaders. Matthew 26, and this is uh, the occasion that we have just been reading about in the sermonette, only this is in the other gospel. Uh, this is a little bit later in the evening when uh, Jesus Christ, before he was crucified, went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And in verse 36, he says, uh, at the end of the verse, he says, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. They knew what he was doing, and this was a rather common thing with him, because he prayed regularly, he prayed long, and he prayed in uh, many places, in many circumstances, as uh, I just mentioned a little while ago. So he says, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. Now, you would think if the boss, if the, the Lord, if the Christ uh, were off praying somewhere, that that was not the time, you know, for fun and games. You know, you'd think, well, now, my, if he's going to go off and pray like that, I ought to be spending some time in prayer here, too. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And he realized, of course, within that 24-hour day, he was going to die after being uh, tormented and uh, uh, crucified. So he knew what was going to happen. They didn't. He realized the crisis that they were in at that particular time. They didn't. Uh, Peter, even though he had been told already this evening, you know, that you're going to deny me three times this night, probably didn't realize this, the extreme or the supreme, we might say, crisis that he and the others faced that very day, that night. And uh, he said to them, let's see, I guess we read that, Tear you here and watch with me. No, let's read the verse 38. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry you here and watch with me. Now, he doesn't say pray, but I think it's implied, as we'll see a little bit later. And he went a little further. So he was uh, by himself privately and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will. That is our will. Now, this is just uh, telling us what he prayed about. This is not the prayer. You know, he didn't just uh, speak this one sentence and then uh, uh, let it go at that. And he came unto the disciples and found them asleep. That is, uh, these two, I guess. And he said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? So I guess that what he is saying here, among other things, is that an hour had elapsed since he told them, Will you watch here? And he came back and he found them asleep. And he says, couldn't you watch one hour? Watch and pray. You see, this is a time now of supreme crisis. And he says, can't you pray with me one hour? Now, some of us, uh, you know, maybe never prayed an hour in our lives. I mean, at one particular time. I assume that all of us have over, you know, add up all the time that we've prayed, maybe. Uh, but he says, watch and pray. So it seems to me like he's rebuking them because they couldn't even pray with him one hour. Well, this is not necessarily the routine uh, every day, but uh, at least in this particular circumstance, Christ said, well, here, you, you can't even pray one hour. He says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they didn't realize it, but their flesh and that weakness was going to be very evident during that 24-hour period. And they should have been very close to God on this important occasion, this climax, you might say, of the, uh, what will I say, the, uh, the Jesus Christ and his mission. 
and uh, what was going to happen during that particular time. They didn't realize the crisis that they were in, and they couldn't even pray an hour. And he went away again the second time, and he said the same thing, prayed about the same thing, and he came back and found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. So we look at them, oh, what was the matter with those apostles? That they couldn't even pray an hour. Well, now two hours have gone by. So we might say, well, what's the matter with those fellows? Well, I presume it was midnight or one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning. Who knows what the exact time was here. I suppose by now it's getting on toward maybe 2 a.m. or something like that. And chances are you and I would find ourselves in the same situation. Verse 44, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time. So apparently from this he prayed three hours. But this was a supreme crisis, you might say, the supreme crisis of his life. And in the time of supreme crisis, we may find that we need to pray three hours, or that we ought to pray three hours, and so on. Well, that was the, the end of that, and, and then, of course, the people who were going, going to take Christ uh, were already on the way, and you'll find out following this what happened. So we see here that he at least rebuked them for not being able to pray one hour in the time of crisis, the crisis. Of course, here now were the leaders of the church. They were not, you know, the, the sheep or the lay members, the, the new people in the church, and so on. Now, on another occasion, and I won't turn here, but it's, uh, I'm sure you remember it, in Luke 6, 12, it says he prayed all night. Luke 6, 12. Now, on this particular occasion, he was going to select the 12 apostles. And he was going to select them from the other disciples. There were many disciples, we don't know how many at that particular time, and he was going to select twelve of their number. One who would uh, betray him, Judas, and the others, it would seem like from the scriptures, God was able to realize were going to make it into his kingdom, because they were going to be ruling on the twelve thrones of Israel. We find that a little bit later, don't we? But that's what's going to happen, and so apparently he had to discern the basic maybe the most basic of attitudes of these men, to know that no matter what, the, what happened, these men would, in the final analysis, make the right choice and do the right thing, as Mr. Baird was talking about a little earlier. So, uh, you know, that took a special discernment, a very, very special discernment. And so he prayed all night that he might select exactly the right ones. Now, he might have selected the wrong ones, and maybe in a, a day or a month or a year, or a couple of years, maybe some of them would have fallen away. If you would look at the number of people who have come into God's church in our time, I don't know how many of them have come and gone, uh, but maybe as many have come and gone as are still in God's church. I don't know. Sometimes it seems that way. Uh, and uh, on that basis, you know, if he selected 12 and 6 of them fell by the wayside, he would have selected the wrong men. So he needed special discernment and help from God to know the ones who had that basic attitude that were going to obey God in the long run, no matter what happened. They make a lot of mistakes. They have to learn a lot of lessons. But they had, you might say, the right material, the right metal that was going to come forth, you know, as gold in the end. Now, I'm not going to set times and tell you how long you should pray any more than I can tell you how much you should give in the way of offerings or exactly how often you should fast, or what necessarily good works, at least specifically, you should do. But it seems to me very obvious that if a person is praying five or ten or twenty minutes a day, that that is very insufficient, very lacking. If we're only spending that amount of time before our Maker each day, certainly, to me, this is not nearly enough. Now, some of the leaders in the Church of God have said that we ought to pray at least a half hour or that we should pray an hour a day. And I'm just passing on to you what they have said. Now, to start with, I would think that a new convert in the Church may not be able to pray very long because it's a new experience and you have to learn to pray. Just as uh, Jesus said, or rather the disciples said, teach us to pray. And I hope that the things that I'm giving you is teaching you to pray. And we have to learn that. It's not something that you automatically are going to be able to do. But as time goes on, we ought to be able to increase the amount of time that we spend with our Maker in prayer. And as we grow spiritually and draw closer to God, obviously we're going to be spending uh, a greater time in prayer. 
Now, we need, we need to become well acquainted with our Creator, with our God, the great God who has called us to a very, very high calling. And to do that, to become well acquainted with that God, requires a lot of communication. He has to talk to us a lot, and he does that through his word. We have to talk to him a lot, and we do that in prayer. We need to listen to God in Bible study. We need to talk to him in prayer and meditate on those things of God. And I would suppose that there may be some among us who spend more time talking to their dogs than they do to their great creator. I'd like to give you some examples of prayer, and I have uh, about a half a dozen examples here, and I won't take time to read all of them, but I think I will at least refer uh, to each one of them. And the first one I'd like to refer to is in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. To me, this is one of the outstanding prayers of the Bible. In fact, all of these are outstanding. That's the reason why I chose them. There are, of course, many, many, many other examples of prayer. But these particular ones, I, I think, are very special. The ninth chapter of Daniel, I won't uh, read all of this, but uh, to start out with, it, uh, it mentions the, the date that he uh, writes on this occasion. And uh, he was rather concerned because he read in the prophet of Jeremiah about the 70 years of the desolations of Jerusalem. And so he... As he says in verse 3, I set my face unto the eternal God to seek by prayer and supplications and fasting with sackcloth and ashes. And uh, when he prays here now, it's over a period of time. It's by fasting and also the other things that are mentioned here. And I think probably over a period of quite a number of days. While he was fasting, he was praying. <clears throat> and uh, at least we have here in part one of his prayers. Now remember, at this particular time, Daniel is a very elderly man. This is down now about 538, and uh, just after the fall of Babylon to the Persians, and this is now in the first year of Darius, Daniel by this time was way up in the 70s, probably into his 80s. When you start out chapter 1, of course, he was uh, just a young man, probably in his teens, surely not over. Uh, his teens, I would think. So now he is a, an elderly man. He has served God all of his life since he was a, a child, you might say. He was a prophet. He was a statesman. And he had followed God's ways and obeyed God's ways all of these times, or all of these years. And he says, I prayed unto the eternal my God and made my confession and said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, or awesome God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. We have sinned and have committed iniquity, and so on. And he goes on to say that we haven't listened to your prophets, and that's the reason why we're in this mess, why we're in this captivity. Notice the attitude that Daniel has. You know, it's an attitude that we have sinned, including me. He recognizes and includes his own shortcomings, his own faults, his own sins. He doesn't say, you know, well, if it weren't for my people and the wretched lives that they have lived and the disobedience and so on and so forth, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be in this mess. No, he includes himself. And uh, to me, this gives us, uh, should give us a, a splendid example of how we should go to God. You know, that we should go to God not uh, bragging about our own good works and what we have done, but ask that God might be merciful. And that he might forgive us for all of our sins. You know, not just the people around us, but also we individually. I won't take time to read the rest of that, but to me it's a, a beautiful example of the right kind of attitude that we should have when we go to God in prayer. Now, the 51st Psalm, I won't turn there because surely it's familiar to all of you. This is David's prayer of repentance. Again, setting us an ex excellent example of the attitude we should have and the kind of thing we should say to God when we sin. Because we sin too. Maybe it won't be exactly the same sin that David committed. But sin is sin is sin, as some have said. And God doesn't make any differentiation. Which commandment you break, you know, if you break one, you break them all. And we all break the commands from time to time, either from ignorance or weakness or whatever. And we ought to have that beautiful attitude that David had, as expressed in his prayer of Psalm 51. 
The next one I'd like to turn to is in the 18th chapter of Genesis, Genesis 18. On this particular occasion, God had come down with some of his angels, and he was going to investigate what he'd been hearing about Sodom and Gomorrah. And he had concluded he was going to destroy this city. I'm sure you're familiar with with the story. And in verse 23, Abraham drew near and said, he's now speaking to the Lord, as uh, you'll see in the previous verse, L-O-R-D, or Yahweh, as it is in the Hebrew, uh, speaking of the one who later became known as Jesus Christ. And he drew near, and this is, you might say, a private conversation, but really it was a prayer. It was a, a prayer of intercession for those people down there in Sodom. He realized God's going to destroy this city of Sodom. But maybe there's some righteous people down there. And so he said, well now, if there are 50, I'll, I'll try to just put this in my own words, if there are 50 people down there, God, who are righteous, well, wouldn't you save the city? And God says, yes. And then he began to think a little bit, I suppose, and he thought, well, I don't know if there are 50 people down there that are righteous. Come to think about it, uh, maybe there are only uh, 45. And so then he asked, well, would, would you save the city for 45? And uh, I guess he thought a little bit more and maybe he started counting on his fingers as to who he knew down there who was, uh, he thought might be righteous and he couldn't come up with that many. And so he said, well, how about 30? And then 20. And then finally in verse 32, he came down to 10. He says, God, if there are 10 righteous people in that city, will you save the city? And God says, well, for 10 people, I'll save that city. But there weren't. There was only one. And when you read the account, you know, you might kind of wonder about that one. The Bible in the New Testament says he was righteous, and so we'll take that, uh, the Bible's word for it, but when you read the story back here in the book of Genesis, you know, you don't see too much uh, telling you about the righteousness of Lot. And so it was destroyed, but he tried here to talk God in, you might say, to saving that city, to saving all of those lives for the maybe ten righteous people. Does it matter to you what's going to happen to your city or to your nation? It did to Abraham. You know, he was a man who prayed, who was an intercessor for others. And that's the kind of attitude, the kind of person God wants us to be. Now, the next remarkable prayer that I would like to refer to, you will find in two places. In 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, and also 2 Chronicles, the 6th chapter. This is the prayer of Solomon at the dedication of the temple. <clears throat> I'm not going to turn there, uh, but it is a remarkable prayer again. And on that particular occasion, we find that uh, Solomon knelt down and lifted up his hands toward heaven. It's also very interesting, and I think I may have mentioned this before, to uh, sort of uh, outline that prayer and see how closely, not exactly, but at least how closely it follows what we know as the Lord's Prayer, or what is called the Lord's Prayer today. Then the next one I would like to refer to, and I won't turn here either, is in 1 Kings 18, starting about verse 36, and that's the the prayer of Elijah, that fire might come down on the sacrifice. And what a remarkable prayer that is. It's a very short prayer, and I would think in this particular case that we have recorded pretty much uh, what he uh, said, and not just a very brief synopsis. Anyway, uh, it's rather remarkable to see what he prayed and how he prayed and uh, uh, how he wanted uh, God to show these people who was God and that Elijah was his servant, not to exalt Elijah, but to exalt God. And the last prayer I'd like to refer to is found in 2 Kings 19. I would like to turn to this one, 2 Kings 19. All of these give us examples of the the kind of thing to pray for and the attitude that we should have in our prayer, the kind of things we can pray about. 2 Kings 19, I think I've referred to this in one of the earlier sermons also. Uh, On this particular occasion, King Sennacherib of Assyria came up against Judah, uh, took part of it, and now he was uh, going to take Jerusalem, it appeared, and uh, he sent a, a letter to Hezekiah telling him what he was going to do, how he was going to take the city, and they were going to go into captivity, and so on and so forth. Then in verse 14, 
And Hezekiah received the letter. We might compare this now to a problem we would have. Take the current crisis that we were having in Pasadena. Maybe we don't have a, a letter telling us about it. Maybe we have a newspaper article or whatever. Or maybe we just go to God with the essence of the problem. Anyway, Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Eternal and spread it before the Eternal. He just laid it out and says, God, here it is. You can read it for yourself. Now, God knew what was in that letter as far as that's concerned. You might say, well, now, why would he do such a stupid thing as that? God knew about it already. Well, just because God knows about it doesn't mean we shouldn't go to God and pray about it. God knows everything that's going on. You might say, if you have that idea, well, no use to pray about anything. So he spread it before God. And Hezekiah prayed before the Eternal and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwell between the cherubim, you are God and you alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Now, this reminds me of what we see in the Lord's Prayer, you know, uh, when we say, Our Father, which art in heaven. Now, that's talking about the kind of thing we see here. Here is one example of how we can address God and get our minds on him and his greatness and what it's like there at his throne in heaven. Lord, bow down your ear and hear, and so on. I won't read the rest of this, but anyway, he, he prays here and asks God to intervene on their behalf in this serious crisis. God did, and uh, the army of the Assyrians was destroyed. Sennacherib went back to his home, and he was, after that, killed by one of his sons, as I recall, and God answered the prayer. So those are examples of prayer, and there are many others in the Bible as far as that's concerned. I'm reminded of a, of a saying that I'm sure all of you have heard at one time or another. You may not have realized who uh, gave these words. It was Alfred Tennyson, about 1842. He says, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of, and maybe more than we sometimes dream of, even in God's church. Now, a little bit about prayer. God says that the prayer of the upright is his delight. Proverbs 15, 8. I won't turn there. The prayer of the upright is his delight. God delights in hearing our prayers. And if we are not praying, we are depriving him of that pleasure or that delight. Now, even in our stumbling human way, of crying out to God, God realizes that we are but dust, that we need a lot of help even in prayer. And he does help us even in our prayers. And I would like to turn to Romans 8, verse 26 and verse 27 and read this out of the Revised Standard Version in regard to this. Romans 8, verse 26, 27. You may say, well, you know, I have such a terrible time of praying and I do such a wretched job of it. Uh, I just don't know what to do. You know, I, I, I wish I could be uh, good in praying. I, you know, I wish I could keep my mind concentrated on uh, what I'm praying about and, and not permit my mind to wander on this, that, or the other thing. I wish I could shut other things out of my life and I could really put my heart in my prayer as I ought to, and it seems like I do so poorly. Well, we can ask God to help us, even in our prayer. Romans 8, 26 and 27, from the Revised Standard Version. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. You know, we all have our weaknesses in prayer. We all have to learn. We all have to start. We all make mistakes. We all fall short. And sometimes someone will come to us who are ministers and say, Oh, you know, I just have this particular problem in my prayer. And I guess they think they're the only one that's ever had that problem. And maybe the minister that they're talking to has had more of a problem about it than they had. But we have to overcome those problems. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, even in our prayers. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. I hope, though, that we know a little bit more how to pray as a result of this series. But the Spirit itself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. And he, speaking of God, who searches the hearts of men, knows what is the mind of the Spirit. God knows what your basic attitude is. Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Yes, God even helps us in our prayers. 
And we need to go to him and ask him to help us even more through the power of his Holy Spirit to pray more effectively and to pray more fervently. Now, some final points. We are told over in Luke 21, verse 36, that we are to watch and pray always that we might escape all of these things that are going to come on the earth. Now, that's not necessarily the reason for prayer. But if we are praying, as we ought, then we may escape, quote, all these things, end quote, that he had referenced to previously in Luke 21. Now, this is mentioned in different words back in the book of Zephaniah, and I won't turn there. Zephaniah 2, verse 3. It says that possibly we might be hid during the day of the Lord, you know, during the day of his anger. And also that we might, in like manner, be protected from a part of Satan's wrath, which is, you know, the great tribulation and so forth, which is included in the previous uh, text in Luke 21, verse 36. Now, we pray for things, and uh, we sometimes don't get an immediate answer. And we may think that God has forgotten about our prayers. But he hasn't. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, it mentions about the prayers of the saints and how that they are in vials. And in Revelation 8, verse 3, there is another comment about this that I'd like to turn to. We'll take time to read both of them because uh, we should be closing shortly. Revelation 8, in verse 3, this now is the time of the seventh seal. Uh, or to put it in other words, the day of the Lord, which is implied in verse 17 of chapter 6. Uh, you might say also what we uh, d- just referred to in Zephaniah 2 verse 3, you know, that you might be hid during the day of the Lord. <clears throat> now, starting in verse 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar, and a golden censer, uh, now you burn incense in a censer, And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Now, I don't know that I fully understand exactly what is implied here, but to me, what it is saying is that the prayers of the saints have been bottled up, as it mentions in another scripture, and as I referred to in chapter 5, verse 8, maybe I should just read that. Uh, It mentions about these uh, golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Now, you may think that some of the prayers that you have prayed have been forgotten. But it seems to me that God has those prayers, either all of them or part of them, I don't know which, bottled up, and they are offered up to him at a specific time. And when is that specific time? At the beginning of the day of the Lord. The time when God now is going to intervene in the affairs of the world to uh, punish the nations for their sins and to ultimately bring the whole world to repentance. And also to protect his saints and to grant to them, a little bit later at the end of this day of the Lord, to grant to them immortality in his kingdom. What is it that we pray about? We pray about many things, but what is the most urgent, what is the most basic, what is the principal thing that we pray about? Well, I think that God's kingdom might come, that he might protect us, uh, included in that, you know, in the intervening affairs that just precede that, and might grant immortality to us in his kingdom. Now, maybe there's more than that, but at least basically I think it's those things. At this particular juncture... I believe God then sets about to answer those prayers after they are offered up to him. So don't think that just because you prayed about something one time that God has forgotten. I think this is evidence that he has not forgotten. Now, brethren, we need to be a praying church. It has been said that an army goes on its stomach, but the church of God goes on its knees. And I would like to ask, do you? Prayer is a bit like exercise. If you don't exercise your body, exercise your muscles regularly, your muscles may not have the necessary strength when a physical crisis comes. Now, in a similar way, 
if we do not pray regularly and long before our God, we may not have the necessary spiritual strength when a spiritual crisis comes. And so we'd better be exercising, not necessarily our biceps and triceps and whatever else, we'd better be exercising our knee muscles or our knee joints in prayer to God. And finally, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, which to me is certainly very encouraging in regard to all of these things that we've been reading about the subject of prayer. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly, or as Revised Standard Version says, with confidence under the throne of grace. Now he's talking about prayer. That's how we come to God's throne of grace. So, brethren, let us come boldly or with confidence in prayer to that throne of grace in heaven, that we may obtain mercy, unmerited pardon, you might say, forgiveness, help, strength, and so on, and find grace to help in time of need. Brethren, there are going to be many times of need and many times of difficulty, extreme difficulty for all of us in the days and months and years ahead. And we need to be close to our God, praying regularly and long, so that as these crises come, that we can survive, and that we can, in due time, enter into God's kingdom. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.